8.01 on the 23rd of February, 2021. How's it going, people? Welcome to uh, Sports Therapy Association podcast, episode 39, nearly at the 40s, which is fantastic. I um, hope you're all well. Um, bit exciting, isn't it, at the moment now? I've seen happily seeing quite a few of you talking about getting back to work again, hopefully. Um, there is a little message before I start um, from Gary, who can't be here tonight. But he just wants you to make sure that um, I will. This isn't word for word, obviously, because I can never do that Lincoln accent. But um, he has got an update in the members area. Um, this is for STA members, by the way. If you're not a member of the STA, then just I don't know, gloss over for a second. But yeah, STA members, there is an update in the members area. Basic message is just still remain cautious. Um, we're just hoping that the government announcement on the 5th of April will give clear guidance as to when we can all resume work. Um, uh, just to remind you also, the STA website is currently being developed and updated. So do check back um, regularly uh, to check for updates and things. Um, and yeah, that was about it. That was from Gary. And he hopes you're well and staying positive. Um, I don't want to start with like, you know, opening up a tin of worms, but I've noticed on Instagram a whole load of therapists saying, oh, open for work again on Monday the 8th. And I've refrained from saying anything. Um, it's been an interesting week in social media with people ranting a bit. But all you guys are so polite. It's like you always start your messages with, I don't know how to rant. Well, I will do slightly. Why is this person opening up an advertising services and working when they know they're not supposed to and blah, blah, blah. It is tricky, I know. So just stay calm, people. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there is some interpretation by other organizations that as long as the person you're giving treatment to needs it medically or something or is in a great amount of pain, then you are allowed close contact services and to massage them. Um, but this is why you signed up the STA. Um, um, the message from us is very clear. An interpretation of the government's ruling is no co close contact services. End of for sports therapists. So um, stay calm, stay, cl stay together. And uh, before we know it, hopefully, um, as of that date, um, April the 5th, hopefully we'll all be allowed back to face to face. And how exciting, because I know definitely the people in this room, you're all going to be fantastically more efficient therapists. And I'll say that hand on heart because um, the conversations and the, the learning that I've seen in here over the last 39 episodes or 30 episodes is huge. And I'm very proud of you all. And I can see you sharing stuff and it's just great. And I'm really honored to have been part of it along with such fantastic guests. So, so there you go. Good to see you. All right. If you're listening to the recording, then um, we do go out live. We go out on Facebook on the Sports Therapy Association page. And we also go live on YouTube if you don't want to go to Facebook. And that's fine. Um, but if you do join us live, then the lovely thing about it is you can... Um, obviously ask our guests questions. When you do ask things, I can bring your wonderful faces of Facebook up onto the screen with the comments. So Catherine Reimer, for example, is saying, hello everyone and happy birthday, Matt, for yesterday. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. That was totally um, unprovoked. Um, yeah, it was my birthday yesterday. Thank you very much for the kind messages, everyone. That was really nice. Um, Catherine, you made an old man happy. Can you say that on air? I think so. It's fine. Um, so yeah, it's always nice to join us live because it is a networking thing as well, you know? Um, it's always nice to feel disillusioned with others who feel disillusioned as well. I think I read that off our guest blog um, about an hour ago, but it stayed in my mind. Um, Stevie Barr, how are you doing? Brian Huxley's here as well. Timothy Grigg, Mark Noosey, Becky Carroll, the regulars are all here. So fantastic to see you all. Um, and thanks for joining us. Right. So before um, we proceed with tonight's show, let me just go to that. A big thanks to um, Jack from last week. Jack March was here. Um, talking all about rheumatology, a real eye opener, some fantastic feedback again, can't have enough emails from people talking about the episodes. Um, you can't go on too much. A couple of you are like, I don't want to go on, but blah, 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 blah. It was fantastic. It was a real eye opener um, uh, of how these rheumatological conditions can masquerade, which is such a great word as musculoskeletal issues that we see every day, just being aware and just working closer with other clinicians, knowing when to refer someone on if the red flags are there. Um, and Jack um, March is a fantastic educator. And uh, if you do want more information on that, then make sure you do check out his uh, website, um, Rumo, is it Rumo or Rumo? Let me get this right. Rheumatology.physio. 
I never know if it's rheumo dot or rheumatology. Yeah, rheumatology dot physio uh, to check out the courses which he's got going on. Um, and um, and there's some fantastic blogs and information on rheumatology. So thanks, Jack, if you are listening or watching the recording. Um, tonight, dun, 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 very excited about this. Um, I'm, I'm hoping a lot of many of you have heard of this guy, Mike Stewart. Um, you'd have every reason not to have heard of him, because if you kind of like me are just people who live within a little village of Twitter or Instagram, then um, unless you were around kind of, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, then you probably haven't come across uh, Mike Stewart um, because um, he kind of teaches the world and not just um, a social media feed, which is cool. Um, it's presented this no pain course um it's about 17 countries, I think I saw. It's probably more than that since I last looked at the information. Um, met him a long time ago. And like I said in the adverts, if if you work with people in pain, then it helps understanding pain. And definitely amongst the greatest educators out there with regards to helping not only us understand pain, which is a challenge in itself, but the also sometimes greater challenge of being able to get that information across to the person in front of us where we just can't just use our own language, what helped us understand the concepts. We've got to be able to speak their language or let them use their language to show the understanding. So we're going to touch on subjects like this tonight. Um, it really is a chance for the reason I was going on and on about come and join us live is it's such a personal individual subject. And, and Mike's courses are full of practical case histories, getting people to apply it to patients they've or clients they've got. So it is real you know, which lacks in a lot of courses. So if you have got any questions uh, for Mike, then just fire them away. Both him and myself will be looking at the questions here on the side. Just fire them away. Um, the more, the merrier, particularly tonight, um, because it is a subject which is just so tricky and leads people down some terrible rabbit holes as well, um, which I can't wait to ask him about. Um, so, yeah, right. Without further ado, he's been sitting down there patiently. Um, I'll bring him up. Mike Stewart. Hello, mate. Hi, Matt. How are you? All the better, mate. Like I said, when we first kind of met up half an hour ago to have a little chat, all the better for being in your presence. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Right. And before we start, may I also wish you a happy birthday for yesterday? Oh, thank you so kind. That's very kind. Yeah. Very I, uh, what did you What did you get? Some beard clippers, trimmers? Uh, oh, no. I've, I've, I've worked with them for a long time. I've <laughs> let anybody buy me them. I've chosen them. <laughs> no, I've got some really nice stuff. In fact, both my wife and my brother bought me T-shirts, which were kind of based on, it was by total coincidence, the four things that I like in life with kind of like a plus sign or an X sign between them. And they both kind of had like something to do with the beard, something to do with lifting weights, something to do with running. And then the other thing I can't remember. Oh, yeah, my brother got me one saying the other segment was, and probably about three people <laughs> that I like in my life. And my wife had the same thing. And that does kind of sum me up quite a lot. I know what I like. Very, and I, I don't very like. nice. I've had my beard now for oh, approaching about 18, 19 years. Yeah. I went traveling around India and I grew a beard then and it's it's never come off. Well, actually, tell a lie. It came off once. I, I shaved it off by accident and my wife hated it. I thought I, it, we were going for a divorce with uh, with me not having a beard. She likes oh, it. Right. Yeah. So That's it feels very that. naked without a beard. Anyway, less about beards, more about pain <laughs> education. <laughs> There's going to be some great beard analogies, I'm sure, if you're working with a client with a beard, but that depends anyway. But thanks for joining us anyway. Um, it was fair enough to say, I mean, I didn't mean any insult by implying that any, no one in the room here is going to know you, but you haven't been on social media for a while, have you? Has that been like a conscious decision or? Uh, very much so, yeah. And it's uh, it's been very pleasant, actually. Um, yeah, uh, I, I used to use social media a lot and I still go on there, you know, I, I still check in and sort of uh, see what's going on. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not as active on social media as I used to. Uh, there's a there's a world going on out there that uh, that I didn't really have time for uh, for all of it combined. Uh, what with especially you know pre COVID, uh, traveling around the world a lot, um, teaching uh, often you're jet lagged and uh, trying to get to sleep at three o'clock in the morning uh, and checking Twitter is never a good recipe for sleep. 
but once again, and you've done this, or we'll talk about this in a shortly, but you're again ahead of your time and doing things before everyone else kind of jumped on the bandwagon and did a bit. I mean, you gave up social media six years before the social dilemma actually came out. And now everyone's kind of falling into it and thinking, oh, it's true, Facebook are just using me. I'm a product. I'm <laughs> selling advertising. And you just decided six years ago, it's <laughs> working. Yeah. So, yeah. And then um, now look where it's gone. We've got uh, Donald Trump doing what he does. And uh, yeah. Anyway, we could, I'm sure social media is uh, a, a different topic all of its own. I will come back to it. I've got a few questions here for you. I'm going to have to keep looking at them because otherwise I could just talk to you. I do this. I, I love all my guest to pieces and I would never have any favourites. But you're my favourite so far. No, but I wouldn't. It's, um, it's, it's the beard. It's the bearded <laughs> brother thing, isn't it? It is. <laughs> But I've got to make sure that I don't forget there's other people watching. This is actually a podcast which people are listening to. So I have got some questions here I want to make sure I get through to you. And one of them does involve um, a little bit of social media later on. Sure. But before we do it, though, um, I've got to see so much we've covered here. Where are you at the moment? What part of the country are you? Let's, let's... I'm down in the tropics of Kent. So I'm, I'm from Liverpool originally. The accent has sort of faded over the years. But I've, I've been living down in Kent. I live in Margate. Live and work down here. So uh, beautiful part of the world very nice exactly yeah. um and i've been in the news quite a lot recently which is nice as well yes, yes. oh yes yes we have our own uh, covid variant down here in kent <laughs> of course you do yeah so how are we going to start this off um well, as i was saying before i mean a lot of people in the room i know you guys are on the same page um i look through this room and we've got the lovely liz bailey here who was um on the chat show um not long ago talking about uh, physiotherapy for dancers and remote and virtual consultations so hi liz how are you chris kitson's here becky carroll's here i mean there's a lot of people here who are already pretty right. savvy I know, with I know, the bio people. I definitely know liz um yeah yeah so there hi liz. mike rice you might have heard of mike rice yes little, i know mike yeah, i've done some work with mike <laughs> so as i explained and i explain every week i like to try and steer this podcast into the direction of somebody, a soft tissue therapist, that's what Sports Therapy Association is all about, who has heard on the grapevine that the course they did where they were talking about breaking down knots and, and maybe letting your fingers sink into the tissue as if it was a pound coin in margarine. Some of the stuff they learned, feeling a hair through the yellow pages is something that an experienced therapist can do. It's still being taught mm. and then they come out and they get their job and then they read somebody with capital letters on Twitter saying it's all crap. Um, you 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 just got to get strong and everything you've been doing is rubbish. It's a waste of time. And that's not the answer either. So the thing I love about you is, is well, you've got to read social media straight away. But how do we stop people from just being so polar? Oh, it's, that's a good question uh, for these times, especially. I, I, I think... In one sense, I mean, my, my master's degree was in education. And one of the things that you learn when you learn about education is there are stages of learning. There are stages that people go through. Uh, and the first stage of learning is dualism, black and white. You know, if, if you don't know anything about the topic, if you don't know anything about Mandarin uh, and somebody comes along and teaches you Mandarin, you don't know anything about it. You don't know if the teacher is telling you the right language, the right words, the right phrases. You don't know. So you rely on a teacher. At, in that very first stage, you rely on somebody else to give you the knowledge. So if everybody, um, you know, if you think about when you first started as a student in sports therapy, you relied solely on the lecturer, on the teacher, and either what they said was right or wrong. So. In a sense, this sort of dualistic polar extreme that we see on social media, the hands on, hands off thing, it for me as an educator, it sort of strikes of stage one learning. It's basic learning. It's it's it it, it, it hasn't moved beyond that first step. Um, interestingly, the second step of learning is uh, pluralism, which is confusion. I mean, this is this is for example, uh, you know, where the patient in stage one with dualism will go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you know, it's, it's your disc that's causing your pain. And it's either the disc or it's not because the patient doesn't know any different. The, doc the doctor's either right or they're not. And then, of course, if you go to see somebody else, you go to see a physio or a sports therapist or an osteopath, they'll say, well, it's not your disc, it's your muscle. And now the patient's going, hang on, 
the doctor said it was disc now this person's saying it's muscle and so they go to see another person and they say it's your fascia and so this confusion um is actually a, a, a normal part of the learning process it's where we get cognitive dissonance it's where we start to doubt um but it's a really difficult stage of learning to work through and i'm sure your listeners will uh, watchers will recognize this from when you uh, were training that you know you have different schools of thought i remember in my training as a physio maitland would say to do certain things and we had all the same things you know trying to push on somebody's back like you're pushing on a fly without breaking the fly's wings all of that sort of you know we could argue nonsense but at the time it was useful um so it's it, 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 we need to move through this stage we need to get used to the fact that the who you see is what you get there are different viewpoints and there is evidence countering those viewpoints i'm sure if we all think of this last year covid is a great example isn't it uh you know it's not sort of uh it, it, there's differences of opinion as a society people have started to understand that science doesn't have one answer that there's lots of differing viewpoints and debates to be had I love Caroline Story's reaction to this. I'm going to go straight to that. I'm still in confusion now. I mean, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because do we ever come out of that confusion state? Yeah, well, it's interesting because if you look at the, the educational theories, you move beyond confusion. You move beyond that second stage of uh, a pluralism where it's all confusing and you don't really know who to trust. And you do, I think, get to, if, you, if you're facilitated and guided, uh, I see it with patients all the time and with students you get to a stage at uh, the next stage which is relativism that third stage is a case of uh you're not confused you're now in a state of saying well okay look different people say different things who you see is what you get and we accept that reality is complex so you accept that there isn't one answer that i don't go on a course and do 100 percent of what that person tells me to do but nothing else you know, that's the only that 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 is the approach. There's not an approach. There's just lots of different ideas based on the evidence where if you work through that confusion, you you take what works for you. You take what works for your patients. You uh, you know, so that's that's the distinctive difference is working your way through that confusion to a point where you realize this is this is complex and there's no simplicity here in terms of a right or wrong answer. And that's, I think, where you get to. And then eventually, interestingly, you, you ideally what we're all hoping to achieve is level four learning, which is termed commitment, which is essentially where you're comfortable in your own skin. You're, the, you see this all the time. If you think about professors uh, who you'll watch being questioned uh, at conferences, they're comfortable with their responses and they're comfortable to say, I, you know, I don't know. You know, we don't know everything. And when you reach that level, you're really comfortable with where you are. But interesting to consider, if you reach those later stages, if you do reach that level of acceptance and you are really comfortable to be challenged, um, then there's a there can be a bit of a problem. And, and that problem can be, let's say that patient comes in to see you and the patient says, the doctor says it's my disc. And I read in the Daily Mail that it's the disc. Then... It's quite easy for us, despite the fact that we've learned and we've been through this process, it's quite easy for us as a clinician to regress back to that. No, 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 no. I'm right. You know, uh, the Daily Mail is wrong. What you're reading on the Internet is terrible. So we we sort of poo poo the idea that they've read something somewhere else. And that in itself draws up barriers. You know, it's like uh, playing. It's like fencing again, you know, on guard. You're back to that. I'm right. You're wrong. So we've got to be really careful, even though we're, you know, even though you advance through these levels of learning, you have to be really careful not to get your hackles up like a cat who gets threatened and starts to defend themselves. And I think this is what we see a lot on social media is uh, a defensive response, um, which is normal. It's human. But uh, we have to be aware of its uh, its flaws. Definitely. I think that answers Caroline. Caroline's just on fire tonight. All the questions are going to be interviewed Mike Stewart by Caroline Story. Here we go. Um, Caroline says, can you move up and down the learning stages, which you kind of answered? Yeah, yeah, you can. You can regress. And, and we see it a lot. I mean, uh, I, I, my my MSc was in education and it was reflective practice. And a lot of that reflection was about 
well, when have I regressed? And I can think of so many times when I've regressed, uh, both in, in work and in my uh, personal life. You know, you, you can imagine this in a relationship. No, 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 I'm right, you're wrong. Uh, but there's got to be a sort of middle ground somewhere. There really has. Uh, one more thing before I forget on this, and I, I love this. Um, I don't know about you, Matt, and I don't know about everybody else who's listening, but I often think one of the problems with being a, a clinician and doing a job like we do is that it is complex and it is confusing and it is unpredictable. And sometimes that means that we take home guilt. We, you know, I, I don't know about anyone else. You can tell us in the chat, but uh, I often come home and think, oh, I'm not very good at this. Why didn't I get that person better? I'm sure somebody else would have done a better job. You know, so where you beat yourself up, that imposter syndrome type feel. Um, so I'm always looking for, I'm always on the lookout for people who can help me with that. And, and I think Twitter maybe didn't help me with that. Twitter made that feel worse. It sort of, you know, heightened that feeling of I'm not very good because everyone's arguing with each other constantly. Um, so somebody who really helped me, and, and hopefully it can help all of you as well, was uh, I was listening to a podcast with... Um, Professor Stephen Hawking, and he was being interviewed uh, by Sue Lawley. It was on Desert Island Discs, one of the archives for Desert Island Discs. And Sue Lawley said to him, uh, why did you not become a doctor like your dad? Your dad's a doctor or was a doctor. Why did you not follow his footsteps? And he said, I realized from watching my dad with his patients that healthcare is far too chaotic, far too uncertain, far too unpredictable. So I decided to study something easier. I, I decided to study astrophysics and black holes and and uh, yeah, quantum theories and stuff. So it, that really does. I, I use that as solace. And I, and I urge you to as well that um, next time you're sitting there thinking, uh, you know, why aren't I getting this right? Bear that in mind. It's unpredictable. That's brilliant. That's a great idea. Um M Turner, we're so sorry. I think you ended last week's show with a, oh my God, I've got to stop watching these shows. It's doing my brain in. I hope you're saying it a little bit in jest. Um, M Turner, for people who are listening to the podcast, you can't see the comments, so I'll read it out. M Turner says, I'm beginning to wonder how many more of these sessions, she's treating our chat as a session. I think it's like a psychotherapy thing going on here, but how many more of these sessions I should participate in before I complete my current course? Um, as I've got the feeling my responses during my clinical assessment may be different from what I've expected and being taught. I mean, it's a real, I mean, when you're, we're never going to get away this thing. When you're studying for an exam, you've got to give the answers which the examiners are looking for and which are in the spec. And a lot of an exam has to be, to a certain extent, black or white, because if every question is it depends, it gets very difficult to mark, doesn't it? Mm. But have you got any advice for people who, particularly with soft tissue therapy exams, because they are going to have to put down one of the advantages of manual therapy is it can break down adhesions and improve circulation. That if you don't put that answer down, especially if it's multiple choice, which only gives you one option, then you're not going to pass the exam. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So it's 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 sort of ticking the box, isn't it? It's mm. uh, essentially, and, and we see this a lot. I mean, I, I always talk about this. I, I talk to people about the problems with the the VAS score for pain. You know, as soon as we say to patients, naught to ten, how's your pain? We know that's a problem because we're getting them to just focus on their pain constantly. And, and we know one thing for sure. If you get people to keep focusing on their pain, they'll notice more pain. Just like if you look out the window, you'll know what the weather's up to. If you stare at your thumb for long enough, it will start to feel differently. So you attend. We get people to attend to their pain all the time, which can be a bit of an issue. So, yeah. Uh, Uh, that's very black and white. It's very stage one dualistic, right or wrong. But in reality, I mean, come back to what Stephen Hawking was saying, that, that you know, nothing is clear, nothing is certain. Uh, it's uh, the muddy swamp of confusion. And I think uh, sometimes we have to accept that and get used to it and find some firm ground in that muddy swamp where we can feel confident and comfortable uh, and hopefully that's what uh, we can start to do as we have a better understanding, like, for example, with massage, you know, we know that massage is not just doing the breaking down of adhesions of, of changing circulation. We know that there's more complex pathways uh, taking place. And uh, my work in the past with the Olympic Association sort of really brought that home about the complexity of what we do with our hands. Tell me a bit more about that. What work were you doing with them? 
Yeah, uh, I, I I did some work. We wrote some papers. It was um, some uh, review papers of where we are in terms of elite sport and the management of pain. So there was, I think, 16 or 17 of us got together at the headquarters in Switzerland for a few days. Uh, we all were given different tasks. Interestingly, for, for this evening, one of my tasks in those three days was to assess the evidence for what clinicians do to athletes in elite events. So we looked at the data from 2012 Olympic Games and we found obviously a lot of um, passive uh, short-term care, you know, a lot of manual therapy, lots of electrotherapy. Uh, and I was there to try and assess the evidence and look at the evidence and whether there's another way we can do things. And there's the evidence, it didn't take me a great deal of time to run through the evidence. There's not a great deal of evidence for some of these techniques. But that said, there's not a great deal of evidence for the rationale that we use them for. You know, so uh, we tend to found that, you know, why do people use these techniques? Sometimes it's um, it, it's because they have this belief because from given to them by their training. Sometimes it can be sales pitched. Sometimes it is sort of, you know, I can sell you something with this. Um, but often it's just due to uh, a, 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 an understanding from their training as to this will work, therefore it works like this. And we know that, you know, we're just really scratching the surface. If we think about manual therapy and we think about it in just terms of localized changes within the tissues of the joint, we're, we're not really exploring the big picture. And, and that's a problem for not just us, but obviously for people living with these problems and for athletes. So um, yeah, so we we looked at you know how can we how can we try and change the way that people think about pain in sport. Fantastic. Um, I want to regress a little bit, just backpedal a little bit, because we're talking again as if everybody understands why traditional beliefs in manual therapy and concentrating on breaking down adhesions. We can kind of take it down to adding the psycho to the sorry adding the psycho yeah to the biomedical. It's a bit of a simplistic, but I think it's a good starting point still for a lot of people. So for anyone who's not familiar, what is the kind of the the message behind the whole biopsychosocial where you where you are adding that psycho one to the bio and the medical? What are the implications for soft tissue therapists? I know it's a tricky question, but no, no, not at all. Um, I, I, I think, again, it comes back to that unpredictability that we were saying about with Stephen Hawkins that, you know, if 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 we are just a machine, if we are just joints and muscles thrown together in a bag, you know, then what we do each time should have surely the same effect, because it would be a bit like a car mechanic doing the same thing to a car. Um, they would expect to have a pretty similar outcome each time you change the carburetor on a Ford Focus, you, you know, you get the same thing. So if you think about it in those terms, the unpredictable nature of what we do and the outcomes that we get or don't get really highlight, well, there's something else going on here. You know, we're not mechanics and we're not dealing with motor cars. Uh, we're dealing with human beings who have a thinking, reasoning, emotional brain attached. And it's not just a, a somatic event that's taking place in the tissues. It's a human. And, and I think one of the best ways to, um, to consider the complexity of pain is to think about our own experiences. Um, I, I think it takes one to know one. And if you, if you think back to yourself about when you've had a pain experience, it, it's not simple. There is worry, um, you know, worry gradually builds. Eccleston and Crombers once beautifully said that pain is an ideal habitat for worry to flourish. Uh, and uh, I, I wish I could write that in the back well. But I, I think sometimes unwittingly without meaning to, and it's not our fault, it's a maybe a training gap, a training fault, without meaning to, the words that we use, the posters that we stick up on our uh, clinic waiting room walls, the the spine models that we use, the way that we direct people towards just focusing on the mechanics and the joint that's out of place, all of these things um, heighten worry. And we know pain is based in your perception of threat. Pain is an output produced by the brain based on how comfortable you feel, how uh, safe you feel. You know whether you're in homeostasis or not, and, and for in one sense, 
human beings are not that different to a, a giraffe or a zebra or a squirrel. You know, we're, we're all looking for safety. And uh, and if you are in pain, which may well have a, a biological component, and you go to see a sports therapist and, you know, your worry is, is this cancer? Because cancer killed my father three years ago. I always think that pain is like a gig where the devil plays all the best tunes. You're looking for threat information. You're looking for that poster that confirms that you have cancer. You know, you're in threat mode. And uh, and I'm sure for most of us watching this, if not all of us, you can think back to times in your life where these moments have happened of concern and worry and catastrophizing that drives the, the sensitivity. Excellent. So for people who have joined us, um, just to kind of recap, then, yeah, if you, I mean, what we've got so far is, yes, you've done a course which is based on manual therapy and, and a lot of importance might have been placed on what's happening underneath your hands and the kind of stuff you're doing to change tissues, stretching stuff. Um, normally it's stretching because no one's actually said that you can actually make someone strong through pushing because that just goes over the edge a little bit too much but so all we really learn in these courses is how to stretch people and we focus very much on the range of movement and stuff we're not saying that you shouldn't still do that it's just it's not a car and i think that's a really good because a lot of i always say any course which makes you believe you're a mechanic and you are fixing something mm. uh, Mm. is going to be missing the point because I love that distinction between and a few, I think you've used it yourself in your course um, and definitely a few other people have used it, the difference between complicated and complex. Yeah, yeah. so a car yeah. is complicated, but yeah. you've got the book, you can fix it. Okay, yeah. so loads of different wires and stuff, but humans are complex because there's so much more going on with the brain and everything. And, I, and you know, I, I think you're right, Matt. Frank Sinatra had it right too. Frank Sinatra once said, you can't have one without the other. Do you remember that? love and marriage yeah you can't have one without the other you can't have a body without a mind and you can't have a mind without a body so uh those two things they they work in unison you know and and um you can't work with just one i mean a, a, a classic case of this and it's one of the problems that we see with um the bio psycho social model if we're making this shift from a biomedical model which is sort of really small scale and and misses a whole uh human within the machine sort of thing uh then that's a problem but if we move to the biopsychosocial model it's pretty reductionistic you know i'll give you an example i had a student in new zealand years ago uh, i always ask people on courses you know what's your wish what do you want to get from this course and somebody said um i want to know what percentage of my patient's problem is bio what percentage is psycho what percentage is social i mean think of that and i understand it i get it uh, to, to look for some simplicity somewhere within all this chaos, but come back to what Stephen Hawking said, come back to the fact that it is unpredictable and, and that you cannot, human beings, you can't seg segment them out like that. And, uh, and it is complex. Um, but I think often we've got to find simplicity amongst the chaos. I think one of the issues that we often see is that because how complex pain is, uh, education is, communication is, human beings are. I mean, as Bullington, the researcher once fabulously said, uh, to encounter another human is to encounter another world, which tells us that there cannot be a recipe, there cannot be a formula, n equals one, we have to adapt. Uh, so that means that we've got to be creative, seriously playful, uh, try different things, um, because there isn't a recipe. So, yeah, I think uh, we've, we've got to, it comes back to that idea of uh, the stages of learning again, of, of embracing the chaos and trying to find some simplicity and some hard ground where we can see what it is we're doing. And that's a lot of, a lot of my work involves trying to help people reach that point. Excellent. Somebody mentioned, I saw flashing up Laura Mosley. Laura Mosley was on that same team of specialists, wasn't it, for the Olympics? He was. Yeah, he was. Fabulous I still, work. I mean, I still... As, along with you and Greg Lehman and um, Tony Ingram and Paul Ingram, I mean, you were kind of people who definitely I stood on the shoulders of when I was going through this kind of changing thing. But I think when I learned that you can't automatically tell all therapists, I'll go and watch Lama Mosley. I love the story about the snake because I think that's, again, a, an important 
realization that everybody's going to love Lorimer. I mean, I still say test him out because the mixture of the comedy and the way he talks about mm. stories is, for most people, it's going to be a good way of getting into it. But therapists themselves have to find the right person to to kind of have that light bulb moment. For you, it was Louis Gifford, wasn't it? I think I read in your blog. Very much so. Louis really did change my practice. I mean, he was he was. I, I mean, I was one of these people that uh, I I wanted to be a physio from about the age of fourteen. So I've always weirdly. I mean, I, I'm a twin. Uh, I'm now 45. My twin brother still doesn't really know what he wants to do. But I, I was dead sure, dead certain about being a physio from about the age of 14. So when I got lucky enough to get on a physio course and then qualified at the age of 21, I was like really cock a hoop. I was, you know, this is this is great. And all that training that I was taught uh, in my head, I was fixing people. I was curing people. I was repairing their joints and their damage and uh, and and I very quickly became very disillusioned because I realized that rather than fixing them, what I was doing was was making them quite dependent upon me. And that then led to a huge amount of guilt and a huge amount of, oh, hang on, this person keeps they they see me as the person that's going to fix this problem. And um, yeah, Louis came along and, and really sort of helped me see that bigger picture. I think that's the crucial thing is rather than, you know, the Maitland pushing on flies wings and the cavitation inside the joint. And and also, I have to say that looking back for me personally, um, looking back through my training, it was it was quite stunted. It was quite dull. Um, you know, I, I, I like to be creative. Um, I think if I wasn't doing this for a job, I would have been in the creative arts or doing something very different to this. And it was I felt stifled, to be honest. Physio was very sort of formulaic. You do this, you do this, this happens. And it was a bit boring, really. So I was looking for something a little bit more creative. And, and Louis was fantastic for that because he, he helped you to embrace the uh, the big picture and the chaos and look at other things you could do. There's Louis' books. I'm going to put them up here. I mean, I've got to have, there is a caveat with this. I mean, book one, even book one for some people would just be a little bit too much. But book one, um, I glided through. It was a bit like a Jack Reacher novel. It was just like I couldn't put it down. It was like, mm. oh, brilliant. Mm. once you get to book two and three, I think it's maybe more physio orientated as a sports therapist. Maybe you've done the degree and you've looked a little bit more into the neuroscience behind it. But I'm going to put it on the big screen for a second just so you can see it. But I would still think it's worth. Oh, no, I've just got to do it completely. I would still recommend checking it out if you can. It's a set of three. It became very popular, sadly, after his death um, is when it obviously became very famous. Um, but, um, yeah, a set of three called Aches and Pains um and i mean even if it's one of those things you decide to get in your clinic and then maybe share it with a few friends um then then do it because it is quite expensive it's like the whole explain pain and everything but definitely worth looking into it even if it's just for book one 392 pages because you'll identify an awful lot with what louis went through himself as a therapist when he's been told to feel for this um posterior superior iliac spine can you feel it can you feel it and a lot of you probably on your courses are going no i can't feel it how am i supposed to tell if one's higher than the other if they do like a stalk test or something and i can't even feel it and then you learn that they're different shapes anyway so why should they be level and all this sort of stuff it it helps you like mike was saying be satisfied with being not right not sure and not understand and not knowing the answer so i definitely would recommend it but in the same way i'd also recommend that you go to this fantastic website um no pain and the blogs on there because like i said mike was a massive influence on me as well and it's not surprising if you know um uh, you were attending louis work as well that must have been quite early on then because when did he die how long ago was it oh god it was now um six years ago i think yeah six or seven years ago yeah but i uh, know fantastic really and i think we all need people like this to sort of you know take us forwards and and I, I think if we're thinking about this this sort of change that we're seeing in how we think about pain and how we think about healthcare, um, it's it's going to take some time to really make this normal. I mean, I, I, we were talking before we came on Matt, about how you know in in the past, I think there's been a lot of people saying, "Oh, this is just nonsense," and you know this this idea of thinking about psychology and communication skills and education skills that it's not for them. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think, you know, it, it's, it's hard because, in a sense, 
if we're going to start developing these skills, you have to be prepared to rethink uh, everything about how you were trained and about what you've been taught. That doesn't mean that you have to lose those skills. It, 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 you know, I see lots of people who they've gone so far down the road of uh, doing lots of courses in techniques with their hands and manual therapy that they worry that, well, is what do I do now? Do I have to now throw all that in the bin and start again? You don't. You know, we can uh, reconceptualize those things. It's it's amazing to have those skills, but to be able to bring them up to date based on the evidence. And I, th I think most importantly, I always think about when I'm teaching two things. What does the evidence say? Because we've got to think about evidence. Uh, and the other thing that we've got to also think about is what do people want? What do people in pain want? And um, yeah, I'll show you this, this book. I've got it to hand here. If you're showing books, I'll show books too. A Nation in Pain. This is uh, Judy Foreman. Judy Foreman uh, was an American health journalist, and she spent uh, four years interviewing over 200 patients, clinicians, and researchers. And she came to a stark conclusion. She said there appears to be an appalling mismatch between what people in pain need and what healthcare professionals are trained to do. So there's this gap. There's this, and and we see it. I mean. If you look at the evidence in the UK, there was a study, Briggs, Carr and Whitaker did a study where they found less than 1% of all of the curriculum, all of the program hours, we were talking about, you know, exams and things that you sit in a, a, a college and university, less than 1% was spent on the topic we're talking about tonight, which means that 99 point something percent is spent on pathology, biomechanics, anatomy. Uh, and don't get me wrong, you can't have one without the other, remember? You you can't throw that stuff away. You have to keep that. You have to. Louis Gifford always talked about how you have to have in parallel reasoning. You've got to have like a train track brain where you've got one side of your brain that's thinking about uh, the mechanics and the pathology and the red flags and all of these other things that we've got to consider but you've also got to think about the fact that it's not a motor car, that it is a human being. You've got to think about those psychosocial things. What do they believe? What are they worried about? What wakes them up at three o'clock in the morning? How's, uh, what's it like, you know, has the pain made them lose their role? Like, uh, you know, what they really want in life is to be a good mum, but they can't play with their kids, which is having a huge impact on uh, on them and their depression, anxiety. And so it, 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 we have to think about both of these things in conjunction rather than just one or the other. And it brings us back to where we started with that dualism thing of one or the other. It's both simultaneously. I think it also takes us back to this. This is so important. I've harped on about it for years. I think you were probably a big instigator in it. Like I came from, I taught before I was a therapist. So I'd already very much studied or been hammered down into me things like teacher talking time and student talking time and make sure, you know, that it's like a, a you're giving your students time to actually learn and speak rather than just standing there in front of them. And this is exactly the sort of thing we've got to do with our patients. But when people say, what CPD should I be doing? Since you were down in Brighton uh, and I've been saying to people, look for some CPD, which helps you learn how to teach. Because like you were saying before, and, and you've said in some marvelous blogs, our courses to date pretty much still don't teach us how to teach. They just tell us how to do things and to operate on people. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think this is a huge problem. We know I, I wrote an article about this for the British Pain Society called The Assumption Dilemma. And the assumption dilemma is very much I, 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 I did a bit of qualitative work where we asked clinicians, uh, what do you think about spending the time and money and effort developing your teaching skills as a clinician? And by and large, what we got back from people was, I don't need to do that. You know, I, I have a qualification in whatever my profession is, therefore I can teach. So it's an assumed skill. And, and if you think about it, I mean, uh, I, I often do an experiment where we get people to put their hands up in a room when I'm teaching. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I taught in Paris, I taught about a thousand people in a room once. And I said, put your hand up if you advise or educate your patients on a day to day basis in clinic about anything, you know, how to use a walking stick, exercises, medication use, whatever. And of course, every single hand in the room goes up and you say, OK, well, now put your hand up if you did some educational training. Who went to teacher training? Who, who went through, who was a teacher before they were a clinician? And you get a couple, you know, that's it, or any lecturers in the room. But it, it's interesting because 
Education comes from a Latin word, educare. And educare means to draw out things that sit within. So educare is drawing things out from people, not pouring things in. And if I look back, before I did my MSc in education, um, I used to say to people, let me tell you all about pain. Okay, you ready to sit and listen to my clinical monologue? And then I'd, I'd do this, you know, and you could see occasionally I'd see that, you know, the, 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 the fish hook has landed and the person looks engaged and you get this ah face. But quickly they swim off the fish hook. You know, I'm not really changing their behavior. <coughs> and so drawing out rather than pouring in is a crucial distinction, is a big change. Because in truth, Matt, the answers to people's problems lie in their words and their thoughts and their metaphors, not ours. <laughs> and that's a whole <laughs> the subject is metaphors is something you've talked about extensively you've got some great blogs on as well um and we could touch on that now maybe that was one of my questions i'm just keeping my eye when i'm not looking at you i'm still listening intently mm. there's some fantastic conversations going on here someone said can you come back tomorrow i'm not sure we can uh, get mark mike back in that quickly um but yeah they're very much agreeing stuff that's coming in um yeah on the subject of teaching and obviously, yeah, learning how to listen and eliciting information, that's all teaching. It's all basic teaching 101. And because people are going to learn if they put it into their own words. I mean, I taught English as a foreign language for quite a few years, which helped me traveling. I think some of the things I learned in that yeah. became so applicable with working with people in pain because you're just sitting back and letting them express themselves and you're conscious of going, no two ears one mouth wait you know this, this is it i mean uh, the classic thing and again if we're thinking about the challenges that that we face in making that transition in starting to think and talk and help people make sense of pain one of the key issues that we see is that question from somebody who's living with pain who who and it normally it, it can be delivered with quite a, a a degree of venom and aggression are you trying to say this is all in my head are you trying to say that my pain, you know, because as soon as you start to talk about pain and you start talking about perception, people, of course, say this is real, you know, sod off. It's in my back. I can feel it. It's, uh, you know, how dare you say that it's in my head? So that's a great example where uh, we did a bit of research uh, a couple of years ago where we asked people, you know, what do you think about when you get asked that? And people, clinicians around the world or whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a physio or a sports therapist, uh, one of the big themes that we see is people feel when patients ask that question, they feel like they've done a rubbish job. You know, they, they're like, oh, God, no, I wanted to connect with this person, but now I feel like we've completely lost it. There's no therapeutic alliance. Uh, you know, can I help? Can I bring this back from the brink where this patient now thinks that, uh, you know, I don't believe them? Um, so, one thing we know is when people get asked that question, they immediately jump down the road of, oh, no, 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 your pain is real. Let me explain. And the word explain, we found, is followed by, on average, a minute and 42 seconds of a clinical monologue. Interesting. Yeah, and the, yeah. the patient disengages. You know, you see the patient disengage. They zone out. And they're thinking, oh, great, I found another clinician who doesn't believe me. Uh, because they're pouring in and, and the words that we hear when we listen to those monologues are uh, processing, nociception. Uh, some clinicians will say things like, you know, um, uh, dendritic spines and clusters of rapid action potentials. And they'll talk in this, which again is another dilemma because the education, knowledge comes with a curse. Stephen Pinker suggests that the curse of knowledge is that you get to know something so well that you forget that the person in front of you doesn't have a clue. And this is the same with anything, you know, with Mandarin. If I teach you Mandarin, I just go, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll teach you something in Mandarin. But I forget that you don't know it. Uh, and so we forget the curse of knowledge. Once you combine the curse of knowledge and then you consider the amount of ambiguity that exists in healthcare communication, there's ambiguity everywhere you know uh, if you mix that curse of knowledge with ambiguity uh, there's missed opportunities misinterpretations uh, there's uh, i'll give you my favorite ambiguity story uh, when i first qualified i worked in cambridge and i was teaching somebody how to use their asthma inhaler 
And I asked this lady, I said, can you show me how you use your asthma inhaler? She said, I can't, my cat's not here. It's like, well, I don't understand. The doctor in a rush, because doctors are in a rush, the doctor had told this lady that the cat was the cause for her asthma. So of course this lady had gone away and been spraying the cat with a ventilator inhaler. And <laughs> the cat was wonderfully ventilated and the lady's asthma was doing pretty well too. But you could argue that that's the patient being a bit silly but it's not really. It's it's the doctor, un, you know, forgetting about that curse of knowledge, forgetting that if I say you've got asthma, the cat's causing it, there's a spray. Of course, two and two equals four. So we have to be aware of these things with education. There's loads of other things with education. I mean, one of the biggest things that I think uh, is really helpful for clinicians is understanding that dynamic relationship between how much you challenge somebody and how much you support somebody. I, I, I think without that understanding, without that helicopter view of uh, how much I challenge, how much I support, the, uh, it, this, this really sort of um, it can tell you why sometimes healthcare really works and you get a really good outcome and why sometimes we get this horrific outcome where the patient hates you and as a physio they call you a physio terrorist because you've just given them too much to do you've not supported them enough you've challenged them too much they retreat they feel disempowered they feel belittled we we know a lot of the evidence shows that patients feel stupid you know i don't have the jargon to tell you how i'm feeling and then we come along with all of our big words and uh, you know they feel silly. And th this is uh, before I forget. Whilst I'm on the subject, I always consider this idea that uh, when I ask people why should we bother helping people make sense of pain, which I do on courses, I always say, you know, why should we bother? Well, why is it important to help people make sense of pain? The one word that keeps coming back is empowerment. We we need to bother because we want to empower the patient. And we know from the literature, we know from the evidence that empowerment doesn't really happen very often in healthcare. We're not very good at empowerment. We're not trained for it. We're trained for 99% of our time in the origin and insertion of breaker radialis. That's, that's not going to lead to empowerment. It's going to lead to knowledge about anatomy, which without the teaching skills to get that across it can then be problematic. Um, so I always think to empower somebody else, you've got to first be prepared to lose power yourself. So as a clinician, your power goes down as your patient's power goes up. And that means that you lose your explanations. You have to get better at drawing out experiences from, from them rather than saying, let me tell you everything I know that then contains all these curses of knowledge and ambiguity. And yeah. Very nice. I like that idea. Yeah. The more you empower your patient the more you're kind of basically taking off your cloak and you're i can fix you and i'm going to do everything because you're giving them the kind of let me give you the shell sort of thing you well, yeah because we, we know i mean there was a really interesting study done with physios where scott dempster and colleagues did a study where they said the biggest barrier the greatest barrier to helping patients is the clinician's compelling desire to fix and treat mm. and it, it's actually you, i tell you what you see it a lot when i work with clinicians who work in oncology you see it a lot there because people who've worked in physios, who've worked in musculoskeletal care for years, and then they change their job. You know, they, they go and work in, in palliative care in oncology. And they often realize that it's only when you're working with people with cancer, then actually you start to become a bit more of a human. You mm. start to listen more and you listen to their story and you don't sit there and pour your knowledge into people. So there's maybe a bit of a cultural problem in MSK, in musculoskeletal care, where it's all about us fixing them and us telling them what to do. Uh, another, on, on that note, uh, another issue is as a, as a physio, I was always trained to teach people how to do exercises, you know, and that was a big part of my thing. Uh, let me teach you. I, I often joke that I spent um, years at university teaching people how to sit and stand from a chair. But you realize if you uh, say to somebody, you know, if you say to a patient, right, there's a minute on a clock. I want you to come up with as many different exercises as you can do using that chair. They'll, you know, within 10 seconds, they're sitting and standing there, walking around circles in a chair. So that's a case of losing power. 
you know, for me to be happy to lose power means that I don't teach someone how to do exercise. I draw the exercises out from them. They know the exercise. Yeah. And then there's, I always think there's three rules to exercise, uh, meaning, meaning, meaning. So if somebody comes along and teaches themselves how to do a sit to stand exercise, what we've then got to do is go, well, great. How is this going to help you go back to playing with your son, which is what you want? So that's where we're, again, looking at the values, what's important to this person, rather than just, you know, an arbitrary exercise that has really no link to what they want in life. You've got to link everything. Meaning, meaning, meaning is is the key. Really nice. I like that. Oh, there's so much people. I can hear pens scribbling down at home already. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like yeah. these. They're just going to, tomorrow or not, if they're doing a virtual consultation at the moment, they're just going to come out with this, like have a moment to go, you know what I always think, there's three times, and they're just going to come out and then claim it. But you go ahead and do, do. that. Go for yeah. it. Yeah, we all do. It's, um okay, it's getting in nine. I wanted to, like, some of the things I remember changing after I'd been, because you're, the great thing about your courses, and everyone I've spoken to has said the same thing, is that they're very practical. It's like a lot of courses, you do this thing and you're inspired at the time, and it's like, oh my God, this is amazing, I love it. And then you open the clinic door on Monday and you go, right, what am I gonna do? What's gonna change, you know, and it doesn't work. But your course was like straight away. And I remember some of these simple things, and this is particularly for, I'm not saying you have to do these all at home, but these are things which I realized I was changing. And some of them are, some of them are obvious, but um, I remember when you came, actually, and I was already kind of into it already, so I had an idea, but it really enforced it, knowing, oh, my God, Mike Stewart is actually coming to here now. And I had a look around my clinic, and we had, like, these cups, which we spent loads of money on, which said athlete in rehab. And at the time, it felt like, it's a great idea. Do you want a cup of tea? There you go. You're an athlete in rehab. And I was thinking... Oh, no, hold on, they're going to be drinking their tea and every time go, I'm in rehab, I'm in rehab, just reinforcing that idea and making them. And then we had these images, uh, we had the typical, and, and maybe some people in the room will listen to the podcast and um, have got this, but like the typical um, kind of knees with the femur and the tibia and the meniscus is on the side, all red or split in half or diagrams with big red kind of dots and things. Do you must, do you take some pride in thinking that when people finish your course, they can kind of just, totally go and rearrange their clinic and change things the way they sit opposite someone or next and there's so much on your courses oh it, 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 be quite it, you know, it, it's great it's a i get a huge amount of job satisfaction from i get emails all the time from people saying i came to your course a year or two ago and this has happened and actually some of those experiences are on the no pain website if you go to the resources section you'll see we've put case studies i get clinicians writing to me saying I did this with a patient. I tried these things, and this is what happened. So I, I love it. It's great, and it, it's it really is satisfying. And that's that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, especially in the days before COVID came along, where you know, constantly living in jet lag and living out of airports all the time. And sometimes you do sit there and think, oh my god, you know, this is this is too much. But it's it's feedback from people knowing that they're helping people. Uh, my my aim is to help people to help people. So, um, it, you know, it, it, I, I love it when people come back and say, yes, this is working. I, I also love it when people write to me and say, uh, I've tried these things that you taught me, but I'm having a bit of a problem with this. What do you think? This is great because then they're thinking about how do I move forward? How do I progress through this? And it's, again, that challenge and support dynamic, which is important. But, yeah, I've been I've been doing a lot of uh, courses online. We're due to release some dates soon uh for more courses online so um it would be really nice to um to uh, uh to get people to come on and see more things about what you could learn um, i'm generally excited it's like i was saying to this the other day you know when you say to someone oh have you watched um i don't know ozark i'm really excited the fact you haven't seen it because i'm gonna get a kick out of knowing you haven't seen it and you can now watch it and it's like when you're really passionate about something but i do feel like that about your courses because like mike grice has just said it completely changed the layout and look at my clinic after mike's course that's Thanks, a nice mike. example of yeah, what lovely. happens because you do from the moment you open your drop and you think oh, hold on oh yeah as soon as you understand catastrophizing i mean you've got a great word for scrabble and you've got a new hobby because you'll look at everything you see from the patient's perspective. You'll start thinking of every word you use, you'll hear it inside your head and thinking, how's that gonna to sound to this particular patient? Maybe I can use it to this one, but to this person who's already obsessed that they've got a slit disc, if I say the pelvic floor's collapsed, is that gonna really work with this person or something? So it starts a beautiful hobby, which 
makes you as a clinician just feel better about yourself yeah from, yeah from day one which i think is amazing i think so i think for me i mean we said about it earlier when i first started in this profession looking back it was really dull I, for me personally i was i was really bored i didn't really feel like i was engaging a great deal i didn't feel like i was really helping people it, it kept sort of you know short-term quick fix stuff now i really feel like i'm able to enable people empower people and and i feel liberated in what i'm doing rather than sort of going through the motions and doing the you tick boxology oh, i've done that now i'll try this you know that recipe approach um uh, one other thing i would say is uh somebody said to me a while ago I, I i was teaching over in toronto and it was minus 30 degrees and it, it my beard froze you ever had beard freeze matt yeah but i'm yeah. running yeah it's weird, quite easy. It? very weird but um the, it was an interesting sort of anecdote because the the guy in the taxi said to me he said um what are you here for why are you here it's really cold and i told him i said oh, i'm a physio i'm here to teach a course and he said, I'm having physio at the moment. And he used one word to describe his experience of physio. He said, it's lovely. So when I asked him, I was like, what do you mean lovely? What, what do you mean by lovely? And he said, well, I, I get in and, you know, they have the sort of nice music on and, you know, they've got all of the aromatherapy smells and, and it's all. And I was like, oh, OK, I can see where this is going. So it was very, very what he described was this very passive care model that he was receiving and he said it was lovely you know it's really nice so he, he he asked me he said is that the sort of course that you're teaching is that the type of physio you teach so i i think this is a, again another example of education rather than saying no my course is pain education and then and, and then doing this and talking at him for the next three minutes i asked him questions because as, as socrates always said to find yourself think for yourself you know the answers lie in other people so you have to draw them out from them so i said to him um you obviously can drive a car how long have you been driving a car he said oh 20 years and that, how many lessons did you have when you were learning how to drive uh 10 i reckon yeah 10. i said okay how many times have you seen the driving instructor after you passed your test and he looked at me a bit weird and was like i, I haven't i don't need the driving instructor you know I've, I've got it i know what to do i know how to drive the car and that's empowerment driving instructors know how to do empowerment and it, i always think it would be really weird if you were to see a driving instructor who kept saying every three months come back in i need to check how your driving's getting on you just say do one you know I'm, i know how to drive a car you taught me well and that's i think that's what we need to get to the point mm -hmm. of with people particularly with persistent long-term pain rather than uh, sort of scratching itches i think that could be an important sort of shift in what we do. Brilliant. Right, mate. Um, I'm um, I'm quite actually annoyed. It's nine o'clock, um, but um, what's well, nine o three now? Um, you mentioned courses, so I mean it's still up in the air what's happening, and clarification will come from Mr. Johnson soon. But you've got some online stuff being sorted out. Is it a case of just keeping? Yeah, it? I've been doing a lot of online courses in the last uh, six months or so, and and actually I, I'm not really an on. It's not my preferred style of teaching. I obviously prefer to be in front of people and engage and have lots of discussions and things. But actually, um, I've managed to find through a few teacher colleagues of mine some really nice tools that you can use for lots of interactivity. So uh, it's been great because I've been getting loads of positive feedback from uh, people feeling like they're actually in a room together rather than it just being a passive you know, thing where you listen to me talk for two days. It's very much not that. So yeah, we're releasing dates. Uh, they'll be released in the next week. So we'll put them out on Excellent. social media uh, and they'll be live online courses. Brilliant, okay. Um, let me just put your website up again here. Obviously people listening to the podcast, you won't be able to see this, but I'm just sticking up a, a screenshot. So it's uh, nopain.co.uk. That's on Twitter, one. you are No Pain Mike, aren't you? That's, That's been from the, the beginning, hasn't it? Yeah, No Pain Mike. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're the, probably the two best ways of contact you, aren't they? Either via Twitter or through the website? Twitter, Facebook again. Facebook is at No Pain Mike. So, Fantastic. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. And like I say, there's plenty, plenty of resources and blogs on there. And also just, yeah, just you've got like probably, I don't know, well, I'm conscious of at least 10 years of information that you can look through um, and some fantastic blogs and recognition um, from other therapists. So, um, yeah, I'm excited. And, um, yeah, I look forward to that. And it'd be nice once um, 
we are allowed to meet up to yeah it will be fun to have face to face again but i'm so excited as well that just the same as you've discovered through your teacher friends i teach a and p and i've taught remotely so i've found some fantastic ways i never used to like those 3d animated kind of model things i thought mm. oh, no, it's rubbish mm. touch the person and mm. but now i'm just showing my screen and using those 3d tutorials to show the muscles and the relationship and it's just beautiful but I'm yeah. excited that COVID has made us look beyond and hopefully we'll be able to take some of that back and incorporate Most definitely. that. Into Most definitely. I, I think um, it'd be interesting to see what happens in a couple of years or so. And I, I, I suspect that online learning will become more of a norm. But I, I think we will always get together. Humans are social beings, aren't they? There's always going to be a need to get together and learn together and discuss together. It's, uh, yeah, so... It would be nice maybe to, for, to have a mixture of things in the future. Who knows? Mm. Who knows? Mm. I think one thing we've learned from the last year, Matt, is it's uh, unpredictable. Everything's up in the air and we, we have to uh, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Simply unpredictable. Wasn't that Robert Palmer? No, I'm getting confused with something else. Simply irresistible. Robert Palmer. I know. I was being yeah. sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right, Mike, thank you so much. Um, and thanks for people who joined us live. Um, we, well, I can't, I won't put you on the spot now, but I think the most common comment is can Mike come back? Can Mike come back? Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I'll twist his arm. We'll have you back at some point. There's so I'm much more we could have talked about. But in between then and now, um, we'll put some links up. Um, go to Mike's website as well. There's so much information and free CPD via Mike Stewart. And then you've got the courses coming up as well, which, I mean, can't guarantee because I don't know you and you're all individuals, but I'm fairly confident that 99.9% .9 of you will walk away feeling empowered. So, yeah. Thanks, Mike. And Fabulous. we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, everybody, to listening. I hope it's helped. Cheers. Bye, all. Cheers.